Isn't it crazy how songs can get stuck in your head so easy? Sometimes the most annoying songs, sometimes songs that you don't really want in your head, but you can't seem to get them out. Just this past week or so, uh, my wife told me that she had a, a song stuck in her head from, from something our kids were, were watching and just how it kind of had gotten in there. For me, this happens a lot, but one in particular song that constantly seems to get stuck in my head is a song that I learned in middle school. It was an unique song. It wasn't a song on radio. It was not anything like that, but it was a song we learned in class. Where I went to middle school, we had every nine weeks the opportunity to take different electives, from PE to uh, music, which, by the way, I never took. If you hear me sing, you know that. <laughs> music was one. Tech Ed was one, where you got to do rockets and build bridges. That was a great one. Uh, there, there was a few other electives, but there was also, in a public school, a Bible history class. Now, I don't remember much about the class. I don't remember if it was actually any more than just looking at this as historical truths. But there's one thing that always stood out, and that was a song our teacher, Miss Rose, used to help us to prepare for her test. Every time you took her class, you had to, at the end, be able to write out in perfect spelling and perfect order the books of the Bible. And so to help us, she taught a song. I'm not going to sing it. I promised my wife I would. <laughs> but the, the, store, or the song was called One Big Book with 66 Parts. And then proceeded to take through and connect the, the story and give them in an order so that you could remember. Every time, like... One big book with 66 parts, these, these catchy little things, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Lamentations. Is he, uh, going through all of this, it, it helped to, to learn and put. The Old, uh, Old Testament is through, now you move on to the newest story, that, or the New Testament, the greatest story ever told. It helped remember and see the end. But you know, again, I don't remember anything of the class, but that. But what's interesting is that truth would not become clear until just how sound at least that song was. That the story of the Bible is one big book. It's not 66 parts. It's not 66 individual books making up all these different stories. It's not the, the history of the Bible is not about David. Believe it or not, David's not the hero. David was a fool in the end and at certain times in his life. It wasn't about the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. They weren't the center of the story. There's one story, one grand story of redemption, and it ties on Jesus. Friends, that's what we're going to look at this morning as we turn to Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there now. Uh, if you can find it there on page number 963 in the Pew Bible in front of you. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, just a, a little bit of help. That big number there is what we call a chapter number. Uh, the, the little numbers are what we call the, the verse number. So when I say 5, it's that big 5 there. And when I say 17, it's that little 17 there next. This is just a way of reference uh, that you know where I'm talking about. So you would be helped in that. While you're turning there, just we, we've been working our way through this gospel according to Matthew, where Matthew gives not a, a different gospel, but a, a gospel that's tied to that of Mark and Luke and John. Gospel about the one person of Jesus Christ, and yet communicating it in such a way to a particular audience. Matthew's working to communicate particularly to that of Jews. And so his, he's been doing this. He's been showing us who this Jesus is. He's tied to these Old Testament figures of Abraham and David, showing how he's tied to the line of the kings, showing how he brings about this new exodus there in chapter 2, how he comes to fulfill all righteousness in chapter 3. Chapter 4, that he begins his ministry just the way John the Baptist was. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But then we began here in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, which is the most famous sermon ever uh, told, 
Because it was Jesus preaching, not because it was John Piper or Kyle Ryan or Mark Dever or you name it. It was Spurgeon. It was Jesus. Jesus teaches this Sermon on the Mount which radically turns the world upside down. It turns it upside down because it identifies the new people of God and what it means to enter God's kingdom. And this morning, we come to the heart of it. Here in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. So if you have your Bibles uh, there in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, uh, let's read the word. And for that reading of the word, I ask that you would stand here under the authority of the story. Here's the word of the Lord from Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You may be seated. Matthew 5, 17 through 20, the climax. And here's what I think is the main idea of this passage and should be the main idea of this sermon. The Bible is one big story of redemption that culminates in the person and work of Jesus because it is he who alone, or it is he alone who fulfills all righteousness. Let me repeat that, and it's there on the screen. The Bible is one big story of redemption that culminates in the person and work of Jesus because it is he alone who fulfills all righteousness. We're going to unfold this in four parts this morning. Sorry, you can leave that if you're still writing. Here's the four parts. Part one, the law and prophets beginning. The law and prophets beginning. Part two, the law and prophets fulfillment. The law and prophets fulfillment. Part three, the law and prophets continuity. The law and prophets continuity. Part four, the law and prophets righteousness. The law and prophets righteousness. So look at point number one, the law and the prophets beginning. Verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Before we can even begin to unfold this idea of what it means to abolish or fulfill, we must deal first with what does Jesus mean by this phrase, the law and prophets. Is he merely talking about the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as well as that of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12 minor prophets, minor not because of unimportance, but because they're shorter, they're at most 14 and most three or four chapters. Is it just this that he's referring to? No. When Jesus says here that uh, he has come to fulfill the law and the prophets, he's talking about the whole of the Old Testament. Those 39 books from Genesis to Malachi, Jesus is saying, I have not come to abolish these, but I've come to fulfill. Particularly these books of the Bible, these 39 books, are the story of God's redemptive start. It starts there in the garden of him being the one to create it, and it's all good. Everything's good. But then you think of how the, the story of redemption begins to be made plain and revealed. The fall, we're communicated that the fall takes place of Adam and Eve eating of the forbidden fruit from the tree. They rejected God as king as the authority over them. They wanted to be like God instead of submit to God and be in his image according to his ways. Sin enters the world. But as sin enters the world, we begin to see that this is tracing a lineage. It's tracing a history here. It traces first that of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. We see 
Cain and Abel almost ruin it. Like the read as first time readers were like, what in the world? Cain here has killed his brother Abel. How is there any hope of the promise of Genesis 3.15 of one who's come to crush the head of the serpent? How is there hope of the seed of the woman? But then Seth comes and we go from Seth then to Noah and the flood. God's judgment comes because sin has increased so greatly. He wipes it all out. And then yet he establishes another covenant. And the Noah, or covenant with Noah and saying, look, I'm putting my rainbow in the sky to promise I will never flood the earth again. You can have the promise. And then Abraham, and a covenant made with Abraham, a, a story of redemption building the, from Abraham on. It follows this one family line. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob leads us to God and his story of redemption, how he provides and protects his people by sending Joseph into slavery in order to later protect his people there in Egypt, to keep them from being perishing in the midst of this famine. And then the Exodus, God, again, in the story of redemption, he hasn't forgotten his people, even though they've been in Egypt 400 years. This God, in this story of redemption, is communicating here, I've not forgotten you. He sends Moses, and Moses leads the people out. And then you go from ex the Exodus there and celebration of it in Exodus 15 to the giving of the law in Exodus 19, Exodus 20, Exodus 21, 22, 23. You see this story of redemption becoming to be made clear, here's who you are as my people. Here's what it means to live. This is what Jesus is saying. He has not come to abolish, but fulfill the story that keeps going. Leviticus, it, it lays out the law and further commands specifics of what it means to have a sacrifice and how this is to take place. Numbers, a numbering of the people and their structure and order, where they're to camp in the camp. Deuteronomy, a recounting of the law. Joshua, entering the promised land that was promised to Abraham. It keeps going. You've got the prophets who begin to warn the people. Here was what Moses told you. If you obey, all will go well. But if you're disobedient, repent. Or I'm going to cast you out. Is what the Lord tells them. All of this is the promises of God. What does it mean to dwell with God? To be like God is summed up in this law and prophets. To be a people repentant. Who constantly obey him and see him as their king. This is what Jesus has not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He says, I have not come to abolish this. Jesus wants to make it clear, and it's important for us to realize this, why he needs to make it clear he's not come to abolish this. Because in Jesus' day, Jesus would soon, though not yet, soon be called the lawbreaker. He would be seen by the religious leaders as the one who throws out the law, has disregard for it all, especially that of the traditions of the, the scribes and the Pharisees, the traditions of man Jesus will be opposed for. So it's important here he communicates early, I have not come to abolish this law by no means. Christian, we, we may think this is an Old Testament problem of only the Jews forgetting this, but we struggle in our day right here, right now with this. Because we struggle to see that Jesus has not come to abolish this law. Often we hear this in phrases like, I'm under grace, not the law. Friends, if, if you're guilty of this, don't walk away here continuing in this law. <clears throat> Repent. We hear the phrase, the God of the Old Testament is different than from the God of the New. Phrases, I'm a New Testament Christian, therefore I don't bother with the Old Testament. Friends, if this is you, I, I, I pray as we go through this, you're going to see that Jesus has the Old Testament and holds it highly for us. And so should we. Jesus has not come to abolish this of old. He supports it. And he's here to fulfill it. Point number two. The law and prophets' fulfillment. Again, look here back at verse 17. 
Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. We've just unfolded. He's not here to abolish, but to fulfill. But what in the world does it mean that he has come to fulfill this of the Old Testament, the law, and the prophets? Is it just simply Jesus is the obedient son who obeys the Father perfectly? It's this, but it, it's at least this, but it's certainly more than this. Jesus is not only the obedient son, he doesn't only fulfill the law in his obedience, he fulfills it in greater ways. Just think of how Matthew has been structuring this gospel account. He's been laboring to show us who is this Jesus and what has he come to do? Namely, he's come to fulfill. He's come to fulfill all of it. This is the climatic moment, but this should be no surprise. Matthew's been giving us clues along the way. Matthew one twenty two. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Matthew two fifteen. And remain there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew 2, 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Matthew 2, 23. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. So that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. That he would be called a Nazarene. Matthew 3, 15. Then Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. Matthew, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has given us clue after clue. This is why Jesus came. This is one of the main purposes of Matthew's gospel account to show that Jesus not only is the King of Kings, but he's the one to come fulfill every prophecy. He's come to fulfill it all. He's the one to fulfill bringing God's peace on. This Jesus is the fulfillment. Friends, this is why here that Jesus, yes, he comes to fulfill all righteousness. He comes in perfect obedience to the Father, fulfilling what we could never fulfill. Friends, imagine all the law. Exodus 19 to Exodus 23. We're familiar probably most with, with parts of Exodus 20 and the giving of the Ten Commandments. But there's more to it than just those ten. Do you know there in the book of Exodus, it is given specific instructions to the people. Here's how you interact with one another. Here's how you interact in conflict. Here's how you interact in dealing with those that are too impoverished and have to become slaves. Here's how you structure all of this and how the releases to take place in all of these relationships. Here's how you care for the vulnerable. Here's how you live out social justice among you. All of these laws, none of us can keep perfectly. Even here in a church, we are tempted to harm one another, to hurt one another. Friends, if you're visiting with us this morning and you're looking for the perfect church, guess what? You've come to the wrong place because we're not here because we have it all together. Conflict happens even here. We're here because we need Jesus. We need God's grace, and we try to show that grace to one another. But this Jesus, he fulfilled it perfectly. He fulfilled every law, every command of the Father. He was the perfect son in perfect obedience. But there's more. How else, if Jesus isn't the fulfillment just of, of the law and the or of obedience, then why can we tie this of Jeremiah 31, 5, which says... A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. How could this be tied to Jesus and him be the fulfillment of it if it wasn't more that he's come to do? Everything of the Old Testament has been pointing to this Jesus. He's the fulfillment of it all. All of it's pointing to him. Even that of uh, Abraham and denying his Sarah as his wife somehow is pointing to Jesus. All of these stories of Ruth and Boaz is pointing to Jesus. That 
entrance into the promised land. Guess what? As great as the entrance into the promised land, the land flowing of milk and honey was, it's to point us to something greater that's fulfilled in Jesus, the ushering in of a better kingdom, a more eternal kingdom. It all points to Jesus, and he's the fulfillment of it all. But if it's the case here with tying Jeremiah 31 it, or 5 here, the weeping of Ramah, how much more so is it to the promises of old, that promise of one who's come to be the suffering servant, the one who would shed his blood, who would perish and suffer on behalf of the people, who would go as a lamb to be slaughtered and yet not open his mouth. This Jesus has come to fulfill all of the needs of the Old Testament law for sacrifice. There's these words from Hebrews 10.4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And yet the book of Leviticus calls for this over and over. Offer sin offerings. Leviticus 16, the day of atonement, it tells to have one goat slaughtered and one goat sent off with the sin, carrying the sins of the people way into the wilderness, carrying them off. And yet we see there in Hebrews 10, 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, yet they were to point us to our desperate need and something more. Who fulfills this? Well, Jesus Hebrews 10, 14, it goes on to say 10 verses later, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. As Jesus comes, and by the shedding of his blood once on the cross of Calvary, takes away the sins of the world. There is no more offering of sacrifice because Jesus has satisfied God's wrath in drinking the whole cup of it on the cross. This Jesus fulfills all of these promises. Look in full here, Isaiah 53, verses 2 through 7. For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Christian, you see how Jesus has come to fulfill all of the law and the prophets. Everything that the law and prophets pointed to, Jesus is the one it pointed to. Namely, the one who comes as the Messiah King, who's also the sovereign servant in one. Jesus is King, but he's the one who will go to the cross. He's the one who will tell, once Peter makes the confession, when we get to Matthew 16, Peter makes that confession. He, he observes who do people say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. But what happens a few verses later? Peter says, far be it from you that you should go to the cross. And Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. Friends, this is why Jesus came to fulfill all of this that was promised. He was coming as the suffering servant to lay down his life on the cross, to purchase us from sin and death to bring us back to God, to make peace between sinners and a holy God. This is what our Jesus has come to fulfill. Friends, we need to see this. He's not come to do away with that of old. He's come to bring fulfillment to it all. But this means as Christians, then, we don't get away from the law. We don't push it aside and count it for nothing. The law and the prophets are continuing 
They're continuing under King Jesus. Point number three, the law and prophets continue with a continuity. Verses 18 and 19. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do that same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The law and the prophets stand, brothers and sisters. It still stands, although it looks differently. Jesus is the one who's come to fulfill, and he tells us, though not an iota, not a dot, will pass away until all is accomplished. Friends, that iota is the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. It, it has little meaning. The audience of Jesus in the day Matthew was written would have known this. They would have known this is considered a small letter and thought of little of. Therefore, what Jesus is saying, you don't have to worry about anything passing away. It would be like for the English grammarian, that comma's not going away, that semicolon's not going away. Most of us could care less about it, but the, those that are grammatical nerds are going to catch it and call you out every time on it. Jesus is telling you, grammar nerd, this isn't passing away, not even that common, not that semi-common. Nothing from the law is passing. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It all will stand until all is fulfilled. Therefore, we shouldn't throw away the law. We need to see it's important. We need to see that Jesus here is the one coming to fulfill it all, that he continues on with this. Friend, because of this, because the, the law still matters, because the Old Testament still matters, I hope you see, even in the preaching calendar, that it's structured to teach us this. It's structured to drive this home in the life of our church. Think about it. What did I start with in ministry? James. Where did we go next? Ruth. New Testament, Old Testament. Where are we now? Matthew. Guess what? When we get to Matthew 7, we're going to pause this series of Matthew for a little while. And we're going to go back to the Old Testament in Habakkuk. And then we're going to go this summer to Titus. And then we'll probably go to the Psalm or another shorter minor prophet before coming back to Matthew. This old new, because it matters. This New Testament and Old Testament, they matter for the Christian life. We need to learn from both. But let me get a little more personal, friend. Christian especially. When's the last time you studied the Old Testament and read it in whole? When have you picked up your Old Testament and actually read it? Read that of Genesis through Deuteronomy and the law. Read of the minor prophets. Read of the books of history. They all matter. Jesus is the one who's come to fulfill them all. This continues. Therefore, we need to still read it. Again, we don't go and read it as those under the Old Covenant. We don't go and read Leviticus. Oh, here I'm supposed to offer a blood sacrifice and a, an offering of a dove. I don't need to go and slaughter this. No. But we should keep in remembrance that as we read the Old Testament, we should see Jesus and his teaching of this. What does it mean then in the Old Testament when we come to this Old Testament sacrifice? Well, we need to remember that we're called to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. The sacrificial system of the Old was not meant to sit there and simply be a performance. It is to point to the people, look, you need my mercy, you need my grace. Here's what you're called to do in order to dwell with me. Christian life as we live this out and we're bearing fruit and keeping with repentance over and over and over again. Friends, we're also as Christians then, we're, we're called to uh, remember here of the hope of the Old Testament that is pointing us to this and see how Jesus has fulfilled it all. Hopefully you're seeing this as I preach Old Testament. Hopefully I'm pointing you to Jesus and if you don't Go and listen to a guy named Mark Dever, and who is at Capitol Hill Baptist Church, and I promise you he'll do it faithfully. Go and listen to his sermons and see how he points 
to Jesus in the Old Testament. We should see Jesus through it all. Friends, this is what it means, the fact that the law and the prophets have continuity here. It has continuity in the sense that God's holiness and standards have not changed. It looks different because of Jesus. We read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. You know, right now, I'm currently reading Acts in my private time of Bible reading. As I'm reading third parts of Acts, one of the things that has stood out to me is how these prophets, or apostles, have communicated the Old Testament and pointed to Jesus as Jesus the fulfillment. Go and read how the New Testament authors show us Jesus is the fulfillment. Go and read your Old Testament the way they do. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means for this continued continuity there between the Old and the New even seeing that of the Old Testament law of circumcision. Kids, sorry, I'm not going to go into this. If you've got questions, sorry parents, go and ask your parents uh, on this. But the idea of circumcision and that law of the Old Testament for, for boys eight days old and, and older to be circumcised, well, guess what? We don't necessarily aren't under that obligation now in the New Testament, but we are called to have a circumcised heart. Brothers and sisters, you see the connection between the old and the new. It still sends, there's still implications here in what it's simply and pointing this to. We need to read it through Jesus' lens and keep with the old. We don't need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. We need to keep pressing on in it because there's continuity there. There's continuity because we need to see still we have a great need and a Savior. That even as Jesus comes, as he teaches, he's not come to abolish but to fulfill, we're tempted to think, okay, there's a new, easier way into this kingdom. And yet Jesus blows our minds here. Point number four, verse 20. The law and the prophets' righteousness. Verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me read that again. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Friends, we may not be struck by this, and it may not carry the weight it should in our day and time, because we look at the scribes and Pharisees and we think, of course, that's easy. They're hypocrites. We got this. Just don't be a hypocrite. No. More weight than carry to this than Jesus' audience. The scribes and the Pharisees were thought as the most righteous, the most ones who, who guarded themselves from breaking the law. Therefore, they surely are the ones who are most righteous. And so for Jesus to say, your, your righteousness must exceed that? Like, this is impossible. Despair would have began to sink into their hearts. Like, how? How? This can't happen. Like, our righteousness can't exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. They're the most righteous. To help draw this out, here are these words from Daniel Dorani and what he says of the Pharisees and keeping the Sabbath. He writes, They codify how far one might walk, 1,000 yards. How much one might write, one word. How much food one could take out of storage, one gold, without breaking the Sabbath. You see the extents the, these Pharisees and scribes would have gone to? They would have put these extra boundaries to keep them from even getting to sin. And they were, this is why they were seen as those most righteous. Because they took these extremes. Friends, and yet, that's not the law. That's not what was supposed to happen. People aren't intended to merely keep externally this law and live. These Pharisees thought they could guard themselves and, and walk a, a righteous life and earn the kingdom of heaven because of who they were and their, their extra biblical boundaries. Friends, we would call this today legalism. Those who think they can somehow earn God's kingdom by their works and by not breaking certain laws. They add to God's word instead of allowing God's word to stand. 
how we've been here on Monday, put those pieces together. Some of the things churches like to say, you can't do this, even though the Bible never forbids it. Christian, be wise on that. Let us not be of the legalistic mind, because the point here that Jesus is trying to show us is our need of a greater righteousness. A righteousness that cannot come from mere external obedience. Friends, let, let me tell you, and next week as we dive into 21 through 48, it's going to blow this even more wide open. Your righteousness isn't seen in merely begrudgingly, outwardly keeping God's law if your heart's a mess. He's calling to a greater righteousness than that. He's not merely calling, as we're going to see, to a righteousness of don't murder. He overturns that and says, don't even let anger in. Not only don't commit adultery, but don't even let lust enter your heart. All of these things he begins to overturn. We'll unpack that next week, but here's the thing we need to see. Greater righteousness that Jesus is calling us as disciples to is a righteousness that is a righteousness of heart. A righteousness of heart that only comes through him. We do not have this righteousness in and of ourselves. We need him to come because he's the one who takes the heart of stone, rips it out, and puts a heart with his law engraved on it. He's the one who writes this law on our hearts in order to ensure that we are walking righteously in him through the power of his spirit and his enabling us. This is the greater righteousness that Jesus is beginning to point our hearts to, that we need a righteousness that is of Friend, if you're here this morning and you think somehow you can earn God's favor by going through X steps, you've missed the point of Christianity. You will never earn the righteousness needed for this kingdom apart from Jesus. You need to see this morning, you need to repent of sin and trust in Jesus and him alone for salvation. His righteousness alone will save. But friend, if you're also here and you're thinking there's no way I can live up to these standards. See that Jesus is inviting you to come, to take and drink of his righteousness. Come and repent and believe today. There's nothing hindering you, the Christian. We most need to see this. Brothers and sisters, we most need to see this call to greater righteousness. This is all for our lives to value and to pursue and labor after godliness and holiness. Let me quote that, that great theologian, J.C. Ryle. The Christian who is content with a low standard of personal holiness has got much to learn. If we don't see this call to greater righteousness as a call for us to pursue righteousness in Christ, not on our own, in Christ, we miss it. We need to be people who are laboring to pursue righteousness, a righteousness of heart, by hungering and thirsting for righteousness and seeking God with a pure heart and knowing that then we see him as we rest in the righteousness of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, will we here at Planet Lakes Bible Church be a people who pursues this kind of greater righteousness and rest in it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for who you are and your grace to us. Father, we pray, Lord, even now as we come to that of the Lord's Supper this morning, Lord, as we see the sermon made visible and being reminded that Jesus has come to fulfill all the requirements of blood being shed in the Old Testament, that he's come to fulfill it by the shedding of his own blood. May our hearts both weep in grievance over our sin, but also overflow with thanksgiving and worship because of your grace to us in Jesus. Father, Lord, will you do this work? We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.